Hi, my name is Dr. Ricky Little. I'm professor of music at Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. And this is part four of the series, Who's Rocking the House? Music of the World and the World of the Church. In part three, we continue tracing the story of the entrance of secular pop music into the church for worship, covering the Salvationists, gospel music, jazz, rock and roll. And we also looked at the role of Satan in the transitions that took place as this music came into the church. If you were to trace the histories of these secular forms in this musical family back to their roots, you would find that they are all a part of the same family offspring of the same parentage, and they all make their way back to the blues. They all have the same musical DNA, push the same subject matter, share similar structure, harmonies and rhythms, encourage the same immoral behavior, and they all grew up and were performed in places that woke Christians don't want their children to go. In addition to the blues and ragtime, there were many other musical influences that congregated and thrived in New Orleans in the late 1800s, but these two are considered to be foundational for the development of jazz. Another significant force in New Orleans society that was prevalent and is thought to have influenced the rise of this popular music is the occult, specifically voodoo. There were several brands of the occult that were imported to this side of the globe via the slave trade. Voodoo, a creolized religion forged by descendants of Dahomean, Congo, Yoruba, and other African ethnic groups in Haiti, made its way to New Orleans. Santeria, an Afro-Caribbean religion based on Yoruba beliefs and traditions developed in Cuba, and Kumina, an Afro-Jamaican religion, which grew out of beliefs and traditions transplanted to the island via the Congo, to name a few. In January of 2015, National Public Radio produced a music series called Beat Week that discussed the impact that certain drummers had on the development of rhythm in various genres of pop music. The third episode in that series, however, carried the topic how Santeria seeped into Latin music. And being a former drummer, that caught my attention. Santeria ceremonies are for calling out to the spiritual world, said host Felix Contreras. And that spiritual connection is made through music. Some of the beats in Latin, jazz, and Cuban music have their roots in Afro-Cuban Santeria ceremonies. And these rhythms began in West Africa centuries ago. Each orisha, or deity, has its own rhythm, he said. And these rhythms are played on the bata drum to call out to the deities during the ceremonies. Santeria rhythms came out of clandestine spiritual ceremonies into open Cuban, Cuban society in the 1930s. When you put these rhythms together, says percussionist and band leader John Santos, they recreate a weave of rhythm that is absolutely magical and irresistible. And you cannot listen to that music and stay still. It's music that just moves you from the inside out. Now here is a key statement that he makes. The sacred and the secular have shared a place in Cuban music, says Mr. Santos. In fact, the sacred music of Santeria crossed over and gave birth to most of the popular forms of Cuban music. This statement by Mr. Santos mirrors what writer Michael Ventura says happened with voodoo, blues, and jazz. In his book, Shadow Dancing in the USA, he convincingly links the rise of the blues and jazz in New Orleans directly to the influence and music and practice of voodoo. Venduras states, it is to voodoo that we must look for the roots of our music. The music was nurtured and grew from voodoo, but as soon as it was itself and no longer strictly African, it kept voodoo's metaphysic wordless within it and jettisoned the trappings. 
the overt practice of voodoo faded at the very moment the music was born, as though it had done its job here. Voodoo imagery would live in the lyrics and song titles through all the music's forms, jazz, blues, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, and even some gospel, until the present, and many of the mojos sung about were real indeed. Jazz and other pop forms uh, continue to be used as a conduit to express and communicate the beliefs of various occult religions and can be seen in the music of several modern day artists. You can hear an example of this on the recording Echu Mingua by the late Anga Diaz, a famous Cuban percussionist of Yoruba descent. The title is the name of his saint in the Yoruba religion. Echu is Elegua, the god who opens and closes roads. They sing two chants to him on his CD, which he calls a spiritual mass, invoking the god's presence. His twin daughters, who formed the group Ibei, also use various interpretations of Yoruba worship songs and invocations to express their own themes in their music. Afro-Cuban jazz singer Dame Acrosena embodies her Santeria faith within her music, and the British Jamaican jazz and soul singer Zara McFarlane fuses jazz, blues, and soul sounds with the occult religion of Kumina. The Kumina drumming style also has a great influence on Rastafari music and Jamaican popular music, reggae and dancehall in particular. This reminds me of a story I once read of a young African man who once attended a Jimi Hendrix concert. At the end of the concert, he went backstage to see Mr. Hendrix and asked him where he got the rhythms from that he used in his music. He said, because my father is a witch doctor in the village that I come from, and you use the exact same rhythms that he does. Continuing with Mr. Ventura, he gives a few quotes from musicians who describe bits of their philosophy about their musical intent and the function of these secular genres as it relates to the influence of voodoo. Composer Sun Ra wrote, I want to put them in a sort of dream state between myth and reality. I'm dealing with myth, magic, things of great value. Jazz pianist and composer Cecil Taylor said, most people don't have any idea what improvisation is. It means the magical lifting of one's spirit to a state of trance. It's not to do with energy. It has to do with religious forces. Part of what this music is about is not to be delineated exactly. It is about capturing spirits. Mr. Ventura again. This was the blues that was played in small cramped shacks, honky tonks, juke joints, barrel houses, at the edge of nearly every small town in the South, west unto Texas and north to Chicago. In the joints where it was played in its heyday, it was dancing music. Sometimes it was a piano, sometimes a combination of instruments, and often just one man with a guitar. But people came to mingle, to gamble, and to dance. The relationship of dancer was exactly the same as the relationship of drummer to dancer in Haitian voodoo, says Mr. Ventura, where a drummer worked closely with the dancer and could often evoke possession at will. Texas Barrel House piano player Robert Shaw put it this way. When you listen to what I'm saying, you got to see in your mind all them gals out there swinging their butts and getting the men's excited. Otherwise, you ain't got this music rightly understood. I could sit there and throw down my hands and, and throw my hands down and make them gals do anything. I told them when to shake it and when to hold it back. That's what this music is for. 
The music of the barrel houses was noted to be so crude that the more exclusive bordellos would not allow it to be played in their establishments. Because it was considered to be good mainly for the most overtly sexual kinds of dancing. This music, as Mr. Shaw described it, was designed and used to manipulate mental, emotional, and physical body responses via music to stimulate sexual arousal. Even the word jazz has a sexual connotation. Some scholars have questions about its exact origin, but according to one author, jazz comes from the now defunct word jazz, J-A-S-S, -S, which means the sexual act. Robert Ferris Thompson links, uh, thinks that jazz and jism, J-I-S-M, likely derived from the Kikongo Denza, which means to ejaculate. And the God of sex himself, Hugh Hefner said, one has to understand there is a connection between jazz and sex. Jazz emerged from the New Orleans red light district. The original spelling of the word was J-S-S, and it meant sex. It was less, respect, less than respectable, which only added to the appeal for a young person. Let's continue. Trombonist Clay Smith said, if the truth were known about the origin of the word jazz, it would never be mentioned in polite company. The New York American had this to say of jazz in 1922. Lights were lowered and to the strains of syncopated music, actions that are indescribable took place. This is the full flowering, the fruition of modern erotic music, which has so crazed and befuddled the moral makeup of young people. And from Ebony, Ebony Ad Magazine, this quote reads, jazz at its very core is sex. The one begs the other, harmonic tension, rhythmic tension, and even melodic tension, followed by release, matches the feel of the moment, passion and unrest bent up inside a person before the ultimate and sudden exhale. And Wynton Marcellus said, New Orleans was the hotbed of that type of sexual activity, and we weren't Puritan. In jazz music, it says, this is what we do, and it's beautiful, and it's also terrible. And jazz, it's real. It deals with that man and that woman. It deals with depraved things because the musicians saw all of these things. That's what gives our music its bite and its feel. And that's what the world wanted from our music. It didn't hide what went on under the sheets. And jazz music is still sexy today, which makes it even more difficult for me to understand the statement read earlier where the minister declared, the honest music of jazz is made for the beauty of God. Jazz was made for partying, dancing, and entertaining patrons and prostitutes in whorehouses where God was not the subject of conversation. I don't know how that translates to the honest music of jazz is made for the beauty of God. But it's obvious that this same reasoning is applied to the other forms of secular pop music used in churches today. Let's extend the conversation to rock music. Here are a few comments about rock and roll from rock musicians and others involved in the industry. This is their perception of this music, the Beatles. Our music is capable of causing emotional instability, disorganized behavior, rebellion, and even revolution. Spencer Dryden, get them while they're young, bend their minds. Jan Berry, the throbbing beat of rock provides a vital sexual release for the adolescent audience. Andrew Oldham, recording manager for the Rolling Stones. Pop music is sex, and you have to hit them in the face with it. Donnie Brewer of Grand Funk. We take kids away from their parents and their environment to, environment to where the only reality is the rhythm and the beat. 
John Denver. Rock music is a greater influence over the souls of men than primitive Christianity. Glenn Fry of the Eagles. I'm in rock music for the sex and narcotics. Debbie Harry, lead singer with Blondie. I've always thought that the main ingredients in rock are sex. Really good stage shows and really sassy music. Sex and sass, I think that's where it's at. Chris Stein, lead guitarist with Blondie. Everybody takes it for granted that rock and roll is synonymous with sex. John Oates, rock and roll is 99% sex. Frank Zappa, rock music is sex. The big beat matches the body's rhythms. Since its inception, this sexy attribute of rock and roll has not changed. On the contrary, over the top sexual lyric references, images, and musical characteristics have made sex stick to rock like a bad tattoo. It's not just the words or the things we associate with it, but it's what's inherently in the music itself that speaks to the brain and the body. And when you combine all of these elements, you get a force to be reckoned with. I have intentionally here focused on blues, jazz, and rock just to lay a foundation and bring things into perspective. But via musical DNA, parentage, association, mission, function, and history, this also covers the other secular genres that came out of these and have made their way into the church. And if this association and influence of voodoo at the very foundation of this music is legit, then where does that leave you and I as Christians as this music makes its way into the church? Where do we draw the line or do we just brush it off? A study was conducted and results published in Music, Minds and Brain, The Neuropsychology of Music. In this study, the motor pulses produced by the brain to different musical stimuli were measured. The range of music included rock, blues, classical, and ethnic samples. It was found that especially when rock music and jazz were played, the motor pulses produced were the same as those normally produced by the brain during sexual arousal. This is interesting. And I'm not surprised by this finding at all, since rock is one of the offspring of jazz and one of the first men to create jazz, Jelly Roll Morton did so while playing in the whorehouses of the Red Light District in Storyville in New Orleans. He had a front row seat as he looked through the peepholes to see the action. He shaped his improvised jazz specifically to match the movements of the prostitutes as they pleased their clients. So this scientific finding may be one of the most convincing reasons why you might want to keep rock and jazz out of your church services. Why would you want to stimulate the brains of the saints to go in a sensual direction during a sacred service that is supposed to awaken spiritual thoughts? Imagine that contradiction and struggle. The preacher is trying to break through to the consciences of sinners but he can't because the musicians have cut him off at the pass and rerouted the minds of the congregation down a sensual path. Have you ever had that experience before in church? Faced with that, it doesn't sound like Jesus or the preacher has much of a chance. And young ladies, this carries over into the dating experience as well. For some men are known to use certain types of music that can be quite sensual to help melt down your moral defenses with the aim of compromising you physically. So on your next date, if Loverboy decides to spin some jams that create an atmosphere of sensuality instead of spirituality, make sure you stick a pin in it and have him play music that will elevate your minds and keep your bodies in an unaroused state. Ellen White spoke to this by saying, young men and women, have a keen ear for music, and Satan knows what organs to excite, to animate, engross, and charm the mind so Christ is not desired. Satan knows that with the right atmosphere, the right words, and the right music, he can ride the musical frequencies deep into your brain and touch you, lure you, and tempt you, and break down your physically, break you down physically, 
emotionally and spiritually. And it's hard to think about Jesus when all of that is going on. All of these genres of pop music have a sordid history and vibrant relationship with sex. The immoral kind, that is. Have you noticed that? There are song examples from these genres that I could not use in this presentation because they are sexually explicit, triple X rated, true erotic music. And the examples I'm thinking of were created by professional musicians who once claimed to be Seventh-day Adventists. This sexual graphic association of this music matches with the voodoo model of old because just as there is a strong sexual component to secular pop music, there was also a strong sexual component to the music and rituals of voodoo in its early days in America. Because near the end of each ceremony, once the dancers were possessed and everyone had drunk of the brew in the cauldron or the tafia, the dancers completely possessed by the power would pair off in lustful abandon and the ritual would end in orgiastic fashion. Having made this sexual connection and the comparison with Mr. Ventura, which Mr. Ventura made earlier, between the musician and dancer in voodoo and the musician and dancer in blues and jazz, I would like to pose a question. How is it that current day Christian musicians who worship Jesus Christ and current day occult musicians who worship false gods and spirits of the dead can find common ground in these same forms of secular pop music to worship their gods who from a spiritual or scriptural standpoint have absolutely nothing to do with one another. How is that possible? How can it be that jazz and pop are the perfect vehicles for communicating with the spirits of the occult? be the perfect music for immoral sexual escapades and be the perfect music for communicating with the Holy Spirit of God all at once. Anybody out there got that answer for that? I certainly don't. And remember, the reason that we are focusing on these genres of popular, mu of popular music is because they are the ones that have infiltrated Christian music because it's certainly not Chinese folk music that has invaded gospel. It's not the music of the Aboriginal Indians that has taken over contemporary Christian music. It's American popular music. You don't see any music executives, executives from Sony running over to Mongolia trying to snap up their latest hot tunes to use as crossover into Christian gospel music, now do you? The dominant music characteristics of, of this music appeal to the feet and to the carnal in us, the sexual and not the spiritual, and rightly so, for that is exactly what it was designed to do. And just look at the commercial relationships which this music fosters. It sells and identifies with everything from tennis shoes to hamburgers to football to sex to spiritualism. How can it be that Christians would want to put God's name on such or even think that it is necessary, appropriate, or wise. Music designed for partying, to be entertaining, sensual, and passionate, not awe-inspiring, reverent, contemplative, or worshipful. It's quite evident that these genres evolved out of experience in places which had nothing to do with bringing sinners to Christ, but had everything to do with keeping sinners away from Christ and entangled in their sins. How can it be that Christ and Satan can use the same party music at the same time to communicate verbal messages that are totally opposite? For the scripture says, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communication hath light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Satan? Some say, listen to the words as if the music itself played no part. And I say, honey, the message of the music is talking so loud I can't hear a word you're singing. To those who would say just listen to the words and propose the argument that music itself is neutral and that it's words alone that uh, make the difference, Dr. Max Schoen in his book, The Psychology of Music says, 
Music is the most powerful stimulus known among the perceptive senses. The medical, psychiatric, and other evidences for the non-neutrality of music is overwhelming. And it frankly amazes me that someone should seriously say otherwise. It's the music that is dominant, the dominant force, not the words. This is confirmed by Frank Garlock, who says, the words only that you know what the music already says, referring to rock. The music is its own message. Science has shown that music engages and lights up and can engages the brain with uh, like nothing else known to man. It is uh, self-deception to believe that you are not affected by the music itself or that you can ignore it. Now, through such music, which speaks of Christ, but utilizes secular genres, people are given double messages, which lead to confusion, uncertainty, and a careless yet subtle association of sacred themes with the profane. The music says one thing and the words another. I have respect for the rappers and the poppers and the hip hoppers because they know how to make their music and words say the same thing. But as for Christians who try to make this secular cow a sacred horse, I marvel. It's like wrapping a piece of pork up in some cellophane, putting a label on it, and stamping the word beef on it. The fact that you put the word beef on it does not change the substance of the contents. It's still pork and will be pork no matter how many times you say it's beef. This ends part four. In part five, we will examine the concept of worldly evangelistic methods, assimilation and association, worship, biblical principles for selecting music, and more. If you're interested in this series or in hosting a music seminar, please go to rickylittle.org for more information. Thank you.